This episode is brought to you by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. At WeatherGuard, we make wind turbine lightning protection easy. If you're a wind farm operator, stop settling for damaged turbine blades and constant downtime. Get your uptime back with our strike tape lightning protection system. Learn more in today's show notes or visit weatherguardwind.com slash strike tape. Welcome back. I'm Alan Hall. I'm Dan Blewett, and this is the Uptime Podcast, where we talk about wind energy, engineering, lightning protection, and ways to keep your wind turbines running. All right, welcome back to the Uptime Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dan Blewett, and I am joined here by my other co-host. Did you say other co-host? Your host? Alan, how do we do, we do this? <laughs> Alan, how are you? <laughs> Good. Good. Interesting guest this week, huh? Yeah. So Brian Huskinson is here with us today. He's the CEO of Elemental Coatings, a Houston-based uh, company. And let me run down a little bit about, about Brian's background. He's uh, an impressive guy. Um, Harvard uh, educated, also has his PhD in material science from Harvard, where he did a lot of research on grid scale energy storage. So at the very end of this podcast, definitely stick around. Uh, we talk about some of that and some of the research he's done and, and talk a little bit about the, the grid scale energy storage. After college, he went to work for McKinsey & Company, the legendary consulting firm, worked for them for five years. And today he is the CEO of Elemental Coatings, uh, which was founded back in 2018. And they're really getting moving on this anti-icing coating that has applications in wind energy, in aerospace, I mean, in slip and fall, like all sorts of um, safety issues. Uh, you know, this coating can help because it helps ice uh, shed quickly where it'll fracture and sort of slide off and you can you know, get rid of it and get on your way. So. Alan, what were some of your takeaways from our, our conversation with Brian? Well, Brian's company has very, very interesting technology because of the way that they de-iced uh, structures, uh, surfaces. It's not the typical uh, sort of hydrophobic things you see at Home Depot. It's a lot more technology into it, and it has a lot more applications. So it, it can be used in aerospace. It can be used in, on wind turbines. It can be used on homes. Uh, so the, the applications are, are nearly endless. Uh, but Brian's company has really positioned themselves, I, I, I think, uh, to to be a, a, going into wind turbines. I mean, to, to apply the coating to a wind turbine blade to help keep ice off the wind turbine blades would be huge, particularly in the United States and the Midwest of the United States where a lot of wind turbine blades don't have ice, de-icing technology. This coating can be added secondarily on an existing blade and help keep the ice off the blades. That, that's huge. Yeah, and obviously since the, the Texas power outage disaster back in, uh, I guess, was it? January now? I'm losing track of time. February. Uh, February, early, early this year in, in yeah. 2021. You know, we, we wanted to have some different experts with potentially different solutions to what might be done about this because it's not clear. Uh, you know, we had Lasse Hietzko from Weiss Tech out of Finland and they supply blade heating technology, right? So that was one, you know, bona fide solution. And then uh, Brian with Elemental Coatings. This is a solution that maybe makes sense for those where, you know, the expense of blade heating isn't isn't going to add up because it's not going right. to be right for every. And there might be potential where you have both or one that right. you know, comp complements the other. So we wanted to have different experts with different solutions because this is a, a major, you know, a major event drawing wind energy and, and all the failings of energy in general in Texas uh, in, into the national spotlight. So like what can be done about this? And we know many in the wind industry are probably thinking or at the drawing board now saying, what do we do? So we're not on the hook for something like this in the future. Right. Or, or what can we try this summer to put on to get to the next winter? Yeah. This, this 2020, 2021, the summer of 2021 is going to be a lot of experiments and rightly so. So we need to be trying new things and making the wind turbines operate better. I mean, that's great. We should be doing that. Yeah. So without further ado, we're going to jump to our conversation with Brian Huskinson, CEO of Elemental Coatings. So Brian, thanks for coming on the show. Really appreciate you uh, coming here to chat with us about uh, about your new your new venture here, Elemental Coatings. So how are things out there in uh, in Houston with you? Doing well. Glad to be on the show. Thanks for having me. 
Yeah, so obviously we heard about your company um, scouring the globe for, well, the digital globe, I, w- I should say, <laughs> trying to figure out what's happened in Texas, right? It was a huge, uh, huge storm, huge thing in the news cycle, obviously a tragedy, lives lost, and, and I mean, just such a huge economic impact on Texas as well. And in addition to having, you know, a company on the show uh, that supplies blade heating for wind turbines, you know, we found you guys. And your solution, Elemental Coatings, you know, your coatings help ice shed off of all sorts of surfaces faster. So when you start to really think about a place like Texas, where maybe climate wise, this is not a slam dunk to put, you know, blade heaters when it's going to be roasting people most of the year. Right. You think of Texas, you think of how hot it is, how humid it is. Right. Uh, mosquitoes the size of hummingbirds. Right. Um, but, the, you know, your coating might make a lot of sense for a lot of applications in the wind in the wind uh, industry. So can you talk to us a little bit about the technology behind your coatings and, and what your company does? Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, put simply, our, our coating, it, it functions like a, a, a normal paint. So you can, you know, you can spray it on, you can brush it on, you can roll it on. It, it comes in cans. Um, so you, you wouldn't be able to tell it apart just sort of looking at it. But it has this really interesting, uh, fascinating extra property of, of basically making it hard for ice to stick to surfaces. Um, and so we've, you know, we, we took a technology that was actually invented at the, at the University of Houston by our, our CTO, who's a, a faculty member at U of H, who's in mechanical engineering and does all sorts of stuff around, around coatings and, you know, novel materials. And what we're doing is is taking that uh, technology and and turning it into a product. Um, we've primarily been focused on on aerospace um, for a, a lot of reasons. You know, icing is a, a big problem in aerospace. There's actually a lot of parallels between between aerospace and, and wind, which we can get into. But um, we we've done a lot of development there, and then we're focused on a you know a number of other uh, problems. So think. Um, you know, when you when you talk about autonomous vehicles, right? They rely on sensors and cameras that, if they get iced up, uh, is a real problem. Um, and so there's lots of issues like that 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 come up. And then, as as you mentioned, yeah, here here in, in Texas and you know across the world, there are icing issues specific to wind that that need to be dealt with. Um, you know, I think with our coating. Um, you know, in, in many in, in many ways, it, it will work to complement existing de-icing or anti-icing technologies. And then in other uh, situations, I think it'll make sense to just use a, a coating on a on a standalone basis. And so, really, there's a you know we can get into the details there, but that's a, a quick rundown of of the coating and and the company more broadly. Gotcha. And and of course, in in the Texas incident, which we'll cover more as we get uh, you know deeper into the show. There was also not just the wind turbines themselves, right? So we know when there's ice on the wind turbine, especially on the on the, the leading edge, changes the aerodynamics of the blade, then the right. blade might hit its stall speed and, and stop. But there was also a lot of problems with just electrical cabinets being iced, pipes, valves, where they just, we couldn't turn this to get, you know, that open. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, just like secondary, you know, not necessarily up on the spinning windmill itself, but lots of other applications. And is that right that this is maybe something that can be used in lots of different places where then just a quick like hammer and like everything falls off for a, for a technician trying to access, whether it's a, you know, a storage facility or a wind turbine or, you know, a, a power plant? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So, I mean, you can think of putting the coating down on, on any type of surface that you could paint. Um, and it'll it'll basically reduce the the strength uh, with which the ice adheres to a surface. Um, if it, I, I won't get into the physics behind it, but uh, although happy to do so if if you want to go down that <laughs> path. But really, what our, our coating does is it it makes ice crack. Um, with less energy than it otherwise would require. Hmm. Um, as you know, any anything, whether it's concrete or ice, once it cracks, it loses its mechanical integrity, um, and then it just sort of, you know, it'll slough away off off the surface. Um, and basically, what our what our coating does is effectively reduce the the energy required to to cause cracks in the ice. So. Alan, I'm going to throw this up to you. So obviously, you mentioned aerospace as being one of the big industries. Alan, is it in the aerospace industry, is it easy to just get a coating approved? I mean, can you paint a plane with whatever you want? I mean, what's can you take us through that process process a little bit, Alan? Because we've talked about certification 
a lot and airworthiness and where do, what what is Brian and his company what are they going to have to go through to to try to get something like this implemented on a on an aircraft? Well, aerospace is a highly regulated industry, and and there's essentially a set of rules which are laws in the United States that an, an aircraft has to show a certain performance. So flying into known icing conditions is a certification requirement and being able to, to demonstrate you can have the handling characteristics that you need to fly the aircraft safely and that ice doesn't accumulate to the point that you can stall the aircraft and get into a dangerous situation. So there's a, there's a lot of work done on aircraft in terms of uh, the, the safety and the design to make sure that ice doesn't accumulate to a point that creates an issue. Coatings have been a part of um, some aircraft programs in the last ooh, 20 odd years. I've seen a number of them. And, and the issue with coatings is if you're going to rely upon it solely as a as a uh, de-icing mechanism, uh, it, it gets hard to, to support in a sense of how do I know to replace it? How do I know to inspect it? Those kind of things come up. I've seen coatings used as, as, as a secondary uh, effort. So there's a primary de-icing system and then the, and just to help the, the de-icing system along, coatings can be used. And, and that makes a lot of sense, actually. You, you see that quite often. Um, which and, and to sort of compare the two from the aerospace side to the wind turbine side, wind turbines aren't regulated like that, right? So wind turbines don't necessarily have an icing, anti-icing requirement. And as we saw down in Texas, where the economics may not make sense straight up when you're buying a wind turbine, you may not choose to have anti-icing equipment on. And that's where the the problem comes in on the wind turbine side is that a lot of wind turbines around the Midwest, uh, particularly where it's warmer. So even in Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, anywhere where it's normally warm, they don't tend to have de-icing equipment. And if you're going to modify a wind turbine at this point, you're in trouble uh, because it's going to take a lot of expense. And this is where Brian's company comes into play is what there's just a need for de-icing, anti-icing technology to be applied to a blade secondarily, uh, even if it's done even on some of the wind turbines to keep the wind turbines operational. So th this is where the technology, I think, is really applicable because it can be implemented so quickly. It, it makes a lot of sense. So, Brian, you, you said you guys were starting off. You're a little bit farther along in aerospace, and, and that's probably going to be a tougher road for you to, to either get adopted because you have more like certification th hurdles to jump over, right? Um, but it, it seems like, at least to me, that if you guys can prove, hey, we're on airplanes or aerospace is really interested in this, that seems like great social proof for it to be like a no-brainer solution for other industries. I mean, is that is that right? I mean, how are you guys doing with all that? Yeah, that's that's certainly fair. Um, when you look at the the specs required to to get a, a paint or a coating onto a plane, um, they're about as stringent, as harsh, as severe as testing in, in any industry, right? Which makes sense because it's uh, uh, you know the the costs of a mistake are are so severe. Um, so it's uh, you know it's you know people's lives are at risk. So it's it's different than than many many industries where if a you know if a wind turbine isn't producing power, it's unfortunate. It's economically bad, but it, it doesn't quite have the same you know ramifications from yeah. you know to just put a, it lightly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, so the, the requirements there are very high. Um, you know, obvious, it's one of those industries. Once you're in, uh, you're in in good shape. Um, but but getting in is is a real challenge. And um, you know, I've, I so far we've taken real um, you know good steps in terms of getting in. We have some you know really promising active partnerships going. Um, we've we're well on our way to hitting um, one of the the kind of primary military specifications for a top coat. So basically, the the main DoD specification for for aircraft top coats. So we're we're almost through um, that process, which which is wow. great. So we've passed like rain erosion tests and things like that, which are you know for context, uh, an aerospace rain erosion test is basically you you spin a blade really fast that's coated. 
um, and then see how how much the the paint gets torn up. Um, every paint will eventually fail. Um, at some point, it actually it ruins the metal underlying. So they so they run everything to failure. But the, for for the test we were running, they were at you know 385 miles an hour. So actually not that fast by aerospace standards, sort of middling, um, but <laughs> incredibly fast by wind. <laughs> energy standards <Right. laughs> so if we can, if we can pass a test you know there then that's that's very promising for uh for for wind applications yeah and that's a great segue because so, so alan let me throw this to you because you've done tons and tons of rain erosion testing on yeah. weather guard strike tape which is lightning protection for wind turbines because they've obviously yeah. got to hold up in those crazy conditions right um and so brian we've talked about a little bit a little bit about this prior how how is your coating going to handle leading edge erosion, because that's like one of the biggest things in the wind industry. Everyone's talking about leading edge erosion. It's become a huge problem. There's all these different retrofits that solve it. And so if a company is going to go fix leading edge uh, damage, they could easily, you know, hey, bring our coating, you know, do a top coat when you're done. Um, how well is yours? How well are you hoping that yours will perform on the, on, on the leading edge of wind turbines? Yeah, great, great question. It's a, uh, it's a huge problem, um, and and something that uh, you know we're we're hoping to uh, help address. I think out of the gate here, um, our goal is to have our coatings be as durable as the existing coatings. So basically, um, we, we, one, we don't we don't want to try and solve necessarily solve two problems at once: the durability mm -hmm. issue and the ice adhesion issue. Right? We need to at least get one of them done well. Um, and then we can kind of, you know, build off of that. And so our goal is to have a, a high functioning ice shedding coating. Hmm. That said, it has to be durable enough such that, you know, it's, it's practical. And so, mm -hmm. so our, our kind of driving motivation there is let's have an ice shedding coating that's shedding up to standards that are acceptable, um, while at the same time providing durability that's at or near the existing coatings. Um, so certainly at this point, we're not trying to claim that we can, you know, simultaneously solve erosion and mm -hmm. ice shedding issues. That would be, uh, that would be all amazing. I mean, I would love if, <laughs> if you get a gold medal. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You'd be the guy. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, maybe maybe at some point down the road, but yeah, really, what we're aiming for right now is to uh, to match existing coatings. Um, one one thing we do have in the pipeline, um, we actually have some some uh, government funding around uh, rotor protection tapes uh, for helicopters. Um, so helicopter rotors probably experience the most severe conditions of any, certainly anything we've discussed so far. I mean, probably yeah. only short of like like rocket ships. Um, so they're very, very harsh conditions that, that rotor blades are exposed to, and they use rotor protection tapes. There's actually similar ones that are in use and um, not really widespread, but in, in wind energy. Um, and we're, we're actually working on some, uh, these are still early stage prototypes, but um, making some tapes that also lend some, uh, some anti-icing uh, behavior mm -hmm. uh, to, the, to the erosion tapes. And so that's, a, that's an angle we're pursuing as well. Um, again, that's, that's really we we've just started that in in 2021 so it's it's very fresh but uh you know mm -hmm. we're we're optimistic that there there could be something there gotcha so let's get to so you just started to use that word shedding so i want to get into some of a little bit of the physics and and explain what that means because i think and this is i mean when wind turbines fail I, like I, I crack a smile because it's one of those like g cool guy things where you're like Pow! like whoa like <laughs> There's some crazy like YouTube winter. I yeah. mean, they're spectacular because they're <laughs> yeah. way up in the air. They're super powerful, right? So if anything goes wrong, a lot goes wrong. And so when you think of like some of these wind turbines collecting ice, that could be super dangerous if they're just start to get going and then woof, like a thousand pounds of ice just gets hucked off, right? So can you talk about shedding? Because you know we've talked about this that sh you want these lots of little shedding events rather than that big right. chucking a tractor trailer's you know load full of ice right. <laughs> into someone's backyard in the Midwest. So tell us about shedding. I, maybe maybe first it's important to kind of understand like why is ice a problem on the on the blades to begin with, right? So you you mentioned one of the problems, right? Ice can build up and it can throw a chunk 
of, of mm-hmm. the ice, which is a big safety issue, right? And so ev- even if people are working on other turbines next to, you know, it's just, it's not safe to be around where, where chunks of ice could get thrown off a, a blade going, a, you know, 200 miles an hour. So, mm-hmm. so that's one thing. Um, the other is, is they lose power, right? Because the aerodynamics are, are compromised, so that, so they're not as efficient. Um, and then, uh, you know, the other is that you get imbalances on the turbine blades because the ice doesn't build up evenly. And so you get all these vibrations and uneven wear and tear. And so that increases the you know likelihood of, of something going wrong, wrong and overall maintenance costs. So, so that's why ice is a, is a problem. The ways to deal with it are either to try and prevent the ice entirely um, or to make the ice come off in small chunks and very predictably to the point where it's, it, it doesn't cause any issues. Um, most of, and, and in fact, a lot of aerospace, especially with small planes, not as much with with commercial jets, but they are they, they really what they go for is predictable ice shedding, and they know they're going to have some amount of ice build up, and it's just it, it, just getting it to the point where it's not so severe that it, that it's a problem. So um, either of those, you either kind of prevent it in the first place, or if it is going to come off, you want to make sure it's happening predictably continuously and in as small of, of chunks as possible, basically. And either approach can work where, you know, for our coatings, we're really in the second. We don't prevent ice buildup altogether. Um, we, we can talk about how you do that, um, but our coatings don't do that. We try and get regular, predictable, small pieces of ice coming off of the, off of the blades. So if it's, say, for example, like three inches, just hypothetically, three inches of ice on the leading edge, causes the blade to stall aerodynamically if you just you know coating that sheds the ice every one inch so you never get to that three inch threshold then you're essentially in good shape is that right exactly so you can imagine it like a um so a, a piece of ice will stick to a surface with some amount of force right and then the blade is spinning and at some point that piece of ice gets heavy enough to where that force that like centrifugal force throwing it overcomes the force that is adhering the ice to the surface, right? Gotcha. And so that's mm-hmm. when you get a shedding event. Because our coating lowers the energy by which the ice is adhered to the surface, it means that smaller chunks are sort of by definition going to come off, right? Because mm-hmm. the the balance between those two forces just occurs at a at a smaller mass. And so that's yeah, that's that's really what's what's happening. And and would it also so obviously as the temperature gets closer to not being in the freezing temperatures anymore. So that, you know, gets 25 degrees, 29, 30, 31, 32. Like, is this, is it going to, whatever that temperature point is where a little bit of it starts to melt and now it's like, whoosh, it's all gone. Would that also sort of like creep up? Like maybe it like completely de-ice itself earlier than a blade that's not treated. Does temperature have any factor? It, it does. Yes. Yeah. So there is, um, and this is actually true with, um, in any surface that exhibits hydrophobicity, so basically any, any surface where water um, uh, beads up and doesn't like to spread across the surface, um, any surface that has hydrophobic properties will effectively reduce the freezing point um, is, is a way to think about what you're saying. It's, yeah. it's, it's not hmm. quite physically what's happening, but it's, it's effectively what you're saying is instead of water freezing at 32, really it actually has to get down to 29 or 20, you know, whatever. And that's the effective freezing point on a particular surface. Um, Mm. So that's, that's one way to think about it. It tends to be small, like you're not going to take it down into the, you know, low twenties or, you know, certainly below that, but you can get a few degrees of, uh, of help there, which, which matters, right? Cause there's a lot of near freezing conditions, which also, you know, often happen to be the worst icing conditions because there's tends to be more moisture in the air, the warmer it is. Right. So mm-hmm. when you get super cold, sometimes it's just so dry that it doesn't, doesn't matter. It's the same thing on an airplane, right? You, do, you don't actually get a lot of ice buildup at 40,000 feet because the air is super dry. You get ice on the, when, you know, when planes are sitting on the ground or when they're going, you know, take off and, and landing and kind of when they're through the cloud zones. And so, um, yeah, they're, you know, solving those conditions kind of, you know, near freezing. So call it, you know, 25 to 32. That's actually a critical area because a lot of, a lot of the problems are, are caused then. So I, I want to hear a little bit about 
your background a little bit more about it. So obviously you have a, you have a PhD from Harvard in material science. If you Google, uh, our guest here, Brian, you'll find lots of his research on the web, uh, a lot of it in, in grid, uh, grid storage, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit, but then you also spent, uh, five years with McKinsey and company, the, uh, you know, legendary consulting firm afterward. Um, what, what helped you transition from the consulting world, from the research world, um, into forming this business with the, uh, you know, your, your professor CTO out of university of Houston. Yeah. You know, I, I, so the PhD and kind of postdoc and all that, that's a, you know, it's a pure science, uh, you know, what, what you're doing, right. You're kind of, you know, you're in the lab and, and you're deep in journal articles and, and papers. And when I was, when I was, you know, finishing up grad school, I, I figured, um, you know, I need to get some more experience on on the business side, and so, mm-hmm. you know, it ended up going to McKinsey and and kind of on the other end of the spectrum, right? Really not not science at, at all, kind of you know pure business thinking, and uh, you know how do you how do you look at, you know, all the all the various problems that that businesses face. Um, now I feel like I'm in the in the middle in a nice happy uh, <laughs> medium, you know, running a company because we are, you know, we're doing very technical sciencey stuff. So I still get to, yeah. you know, exercise uh, that muscle. At the same time, obviously, there's there's the business components of of you know trying to to get a company, you know, a young company up and running. I mean, we really you know kicked off in earnest in, in 2019, right? So we're still a, a, a very young company, and so um, I like. You know, from a, a career perspective, I, I'm, I'm, you know, very happy with with where I am and kind of, you know, how it's developed. Um, you know, I, I think from, you know, with with McKinsey, I mean, yeah, it's a, you know, it it has a, it certainly has a, a reputation. I, it's a it's a great place to work. I think, um, you know, from from my perspective, the the clear thinking of, about business problems that that you just get get forced uh, into doing there, uh, the first principles thinking, um, you know, and then the communication style and all of that, you know, I, you know, I hopefully will, will stay with me the, the rest of my life. So uh, I think that's, I think that's helped a lot with the uh, transition and, you know, helping uh, trying to get this business off the ground. Yeah. And one of the, the problems that Al and I have spoken at length about in various episodes of the podcast is just getting through to some of these big companies that are often slow moving when it comes to new technology <laughs> and whether it's a you know change of a blade shape because they have to change molds or just changing suppliers. Oh. And in this example, like changing what's on the leading edge, what's protecting it, what might be heating it, what might be, the, you know, the top coat that they're using. I mean, how are you approaching getting your small company seen by some of these these giants like GE, Siemens, Gamesa, Vestas? Um, it just shoot as many shots as possible. I, 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 if there is a, yeah. a secret uh, formula, please, uh, listeners. Coming on, <laughs> coming on great podcasts. Yes, there, please, there uh, please yeah. reach out to me afterwards. No, it, it's just, yeah, you just have to put in, you know, when, when you have opportunities to, to talk about the product, you, you, you do it and, and you reach out and, and, you know, use LinkedIn, use, you know, every, every possible resource to, uh, uh, to try and get in. And it, it is a challenge. Yeah. I, I think there are ways to, um, you know, make it easier. Like we have some active work going on with Boeing, um, which is, um, you know, I, I think comfortably fits in the category of, of large company. And obviously they have a, a lot of, you know, constraints around their suppliers. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, that was made much easier because we were able to bring some some government funding to the, you know, some DOD funding to the table. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it was, you know, we were actually able, you know, to bring something concrete uh, to the table right away, which makes a huge difference, right? So we didn't have to just kind of, hey, just trust me, we have a good product and, you know, put you know, your resources against helping us to develop this product. It was, um, you know, so there are programs like that that are, you know, helpful and that we've tried to take advantage of. But outside of that, yeah, you just kind of have to mm-hmm. just put in put in the work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we had uh, Henrik Lund Nielsen on the show recently. He's the, uh, the founder and uh, general manager of Cobod, which they're a disruptive concrete pumping 3D printer, which like it was such a cool conversation talking to him. Yeah. But same thing. I mean, he talked about how 
they got uh, with GE to build, you know, wind turbine bases and develop that technology and Perry, which is a big uh, like concrete mold and form company over. So when they had a couple of these really big companies, then of course, Lafarge Wholesome, which is like the biggest concrete and like one of the materials right. companies in the world. So those three were like, we like what you're doing. We're on board. So now they had these big three, you know, giants coming with them. And it, it seemed like that made all the difference where if those three are sort of validating what you're doing and you guys are, you know, talking with Boeing and all these other companies and the Department yeah. of Defense and it sounds like you, you are sort of starting to rub shoulders with a lot of companies that, like I said, show some social proof and really legitimize that there's there's merit to what you're doing. Right. And, and the thing that, you know, makes you, you know, get up every morning is, is you really only need one um, good partnership like that, good collaboration that will completely change the trajectory of a, of a company, of a business, right? And yeah. so uh, that's the part that kind of keeps you, you know, motivated and, and moving because, yeah, like, you know, the, the pr prior guest you were describing, right? If, if you get a, a Lafarge involved, I mean, yeah, it can, you know, completely change the fate of the company. Yeah, and they want to see they want to see you work because they're you know in right. some ways they're like putting your, their hand on your shoulder and saying you know we believe in this let's put our resources on, resources on it too and of course Alan we've talked about that with yeah. some of these EVTOL companies and yep. I mean do you see that happening a lot Alan like in aviation and in with smaller you know wind companies where you bring a, a, a important partner into the fold and that sort of helps that get to legitimacy yeah it, it could really change the face of your company like with our company we we've been in this same mode. Uh, for the last couple of years is what Brian has been, where we've been introducing our products and, and, and it's gotten essentially great acceptance. So we sort of jumped over that threshold. And when you're when you're coming through that that gate, so to speak, of introducing your product to, to companies, it's it's it is really hard to 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 try to find those those uh, essentially people who want to be the early adopters, right? You need to find somebody who, who believes in it and is willing to try it because you believe in your, in your product. You know that the, the physics work. It's just finding, trying to find those right people who are willing to try it on a small scale and then expand upon it. And I think that's where uh, this coding, it, it can really make a huge difference, particularly in the, the existing wind turbines that are operating today, because it, it doesn't have to live forever. The coating just needs to provide a service. And because of the robotics have changed so quickly, the repair robotics have changed so quickly, you could apply this coating every couple of years and it would be fine. I, I think that makes infinite sense because the cost to apply it, the, the, the cost to maintain it are relatively low and it does a great service in terms of performance to a wind turbine blade. And the same thing's gonna exist actually on some of these uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft on the aircraft side, uh, because a lot of those aircraft are not designed to fly through icing conditions. But if they ever did get into an icing condition, you'd ho hopefully have some means of minimizing that impact on the aircraft from a safety perspective. So it's not something you wouldn't necessarily certify an airplane with, but it's something that you would coat the aircraft with just in case, because there's a lot of times and a lot of aircraft accidents uh, happen because pilots accidentally fly through an icing condition and then it happens to crash the aircraft. Uh, same thing in wind turbines. If the wind turbine is not designed for it and it happens to be in icing conditions like in Texas, everything just stops. So the, there is a, a, a huge financial incentives to minimize those amount of downtime. And, and Brian, have you seen, because of the robotics and, and the changes in the way we service wind turbines, have you seen sort of more acceptance and, and willing to try things like that because it doesn't necessarily involve a human going on the blade and brushing your coating on. Is, is that opened up some doors for you because of those recent changes? Yeah, I, th I think, um, you know, obviously is the, you know, there, there's significant drivers to reduce the costs of, of maintaining wind turbines, right? And so right. we can ride those tailwinds, right? So as as it gets cheaper to e even just inspect or to actually, you know, reapply, uh, you know, new layers of a, of a coating, then we're we're absolutely yeah. gonna gonna benefit from that, right? Because it, it just drives down um, overall, you know, fully loaded costs for for a product like ours. So so absolutely. Right. Yeah. yeah, and the, the comparable product we've seen in terms of leading edge erosion and sort of icing has been like the polyurethane boots we were talking about for the helicopters where uh, there's a couple of manufacturers are, are going out and 
pre-molding polyurethane boots and then physically applying them on, that's, that seems like a very laborious process versus applying a coating. It, 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 those the costs, the delta costs have got to be um, big. You know, if you got a physical person versus a robot applying a spray-on coating, which is what yours is, that's tremendous delta right. savings, right? Certainly. As far as like your proof of concept cycle, I know you've talked about you know being a factory applied coating, uh, and also easily be a retrofit. I mean, it seems like it'd be pretty simple for someone that hey, we're already going up to repair blades. You know, what do you what do you guys want to coat it with? wind farm right. operator and he's it, like so i mean are you guys trying to get with technicians and say hey you know use us to when you're sanding and grinding and repairing these leading edges try us out or is it are you more sort of starting at the factory level yeah um so we're still um just broadly across wind you know very very early right we're we're doing kind of you know proof of concept testing with uh, actually, we're we're talking with a, a couple of the bigger OEMs right now, um, and we we've done some some testing on on some of the you know composite materials. Um, I think it, yeah, really what what we need and and what we don't have yet is just a uh, you know someone who's willing to just put our coating on on a turbine and and monitor it and see what happens. Right. I mean yeah. that's that's the that's the test we need to do, and so we just need to find a a willing partner to um, uh, to try it out because we have um you know we have you know pretty compelling uh, you know evidence and data again in the context of aerospace but you know a lot of that is 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 relevant um and it actually exceeds the the um you know specs you need for for mm -hmm. wind so really right. i mean that's that's where we need to get is just you know let's get let's get some of it out there um i mean there frankly there are even some lower tech like um you know even around the wind turbines on you know s stairs and ladders going mm -hmm. up the turbine anywhere where you that's have right. ice build up that causes safety issues even much simpler, much lower tech applications. Um, if, if someone was, you know, nervous to, to, you know, be the guinea pig for putting it on the blade, there are these other applications where, yeah. you know, we'd be more than willing to, to try and, and, you know, let people get a, get a feel for the product. Well, well, as we kind of transition towards uh, talking about the Texas incident, you know, one thing that sticks out is that I'm sure, well, obviously, a lot of these energy companies took a lot of heat and there was huge financial loss. <laughs> and they're all probably sitting around boardrooms saying, hey, what do we do so this doesn't happen again? Like people, there's a lot of pressure on us. What should we install? So it looks like we've done our work to you know, prevent us in the future. And a lot of them are probably looking at like, hey, blade heating might make sense, even though it might be you know, a lot higher cost. And others are like, blade heating is not gonna make sense financially, so what's next? Uh, and it seems like you could definitely fit in that sort of like butter zone where it's like, hey, we're not really here, but we also don't wanna do anything. We don't wanna do nothing. So we wanna do something. What's, what are the other solutions out there? And it, I mean, it seems like that's a, a pretty easy, easy yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think, you know, ultimately what, what you know, what wind farm operators going to have to do is look at, <clears throat> you know, it's a risk management question, right? So, mm -hmm. so what are the, what are the probability that our, you know, that our turbines are affected by icing events? And then, you know, based on that, what are we, you know, what are the economics then dictate that we're able to spend to mitigate? Um, and it may, it may make sense that, you know, hey, for a, a, a small percentage of turbines on the farm we we do active heating and coatings and we just mm -hmm. make sure that those turbine you know some percentage are are going to operate even in in harsh conditions or maybe right. it's hey we don't want to do heat you know heating's you know an order of magnitude more expensive than a coating uh, we just do a coating across all of them, and then you know we sh we sh you know we'll end up in kind of a we're better off than we were, mm -hmm. and and it really you know the the decision there just depends on the I don't think you can generalize right. It's going to be even micro environment specific farms. You know what are the what what are the you know climatic differences and and ultimately what makes sense as a, a solution there so i think we're going to end up with a yeah. uh, a host of approaches 
Um, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of see what works. One of, one of the real challenges in Texas specifically, the nice thing, if, if you want to try something in, in Finland or Norway, you're going you're gonna to have, you know, snow and icing conditions six months out of the year. So you find out really quick mm -hmm. if what you did worked. Um, <laughs> the issue in Texas is you put something on and we may not have another severe icing event for a decade or so. So you, you won't actually know yeah. there's not a lot of, you, you don't get those same repetitions and, and trial and error and understanding what really matters. Um, and so that that's going to be a challenge for for sure, right? Because there's going to be, you know, ultimately to figure out what to do, you're going to have to make a lot of assumptions on, you know, well, how likely is this? And it's really hard to, to know how, how likely, you know, events like this are and, you know, how specific areas will, will respond. But um, yeah, I think from, a, you know, the, again, the good news with a product like ours is because the CapEx requirements are are quite a bit lower, the the risk just the, from a purely financial perspective is, is lower, right? Because you yeah. just, you're not spending as much money to do it. That's it. Yeah. That's it. And it, I think you're right in, in terms of locations. I've, I've watched a number of your videos on your website, and they seem to take place up in Flint, Michigan, which is a particularly cold place in the United States. And I, I think you're right, is that as you get a little bit further north, uh, Nebraska, Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, Ohio even, there's just the opportunity is just this really sweet spot because of the, the temperatures are in that right range all the time. You know, plus 10 degrees Fahrenheit to about 35 degrees Fahrenheit, which is where most of the winters are in those areas. Uh, it's a sweet prime spot for ice. It just is. Right. right. And, and that seems like a, and because there's thousands of turbines, uh, wind turbines in the, in those areas, it seems like it's just a, a slam dunk. And I, I, think, I think you're right also in that even if blades have heating systems or de-icing systems on them, the addition of a coating makes infinite sense for just because it helps reduce the stress on the blades and lifetime and wind turbines is is all the discussion as you, and as you well pointed out uh, wind turbine companies and operators are very very knowledgeable about the expenses they incur and the downtimes they incur they know what those costs are and the delta cost of putting your coating on versus the loss of even a, a day of producing energy it just makes sense to put the coating on it just does well, and even with like, you know, so uh, let's say Hietzko came on from Weiss Tech and their blade heaters, which are, you know, like a carbon fiber mat that's, you know, epoxied onto the, the surface, they don't go all the way to the very tip. So there's a little bit of the tip exposed because it doesn't want to get too close to the lightning receptor. Right. And then a good portion of the root is also because they say it's aerodynamically not important. So right. even on an installation like that, it might be, well, let's let's take the ice off the root because it does collect there. I mean, that's still a significant amount of weight, even though it's not aerodynamically important. Right. And then the tip, I'm like, hey, we can't cover the tip. So maybe we throw some coating on the tip and that's probably going to do the job. So even, even within that sector, it might make just, hey, now we can ha have a more complete, you know, coverage of a blade. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think complementing existing systems is where the bulk of the you know the use cases will be there yeah. there will be some some kind of you know corner cases where it might make sense to only do one thing or, or only do another uh, but generally you you want to combine strategies uh, you see similar things in, in aerospace right like you know commercial jets you get you get on a plane in in Chicago and and you sit on on the tarmac they put de-icing fluid they actually do two separate de-icing uh, fluids to get the plane ready to take off, and then they use, typically use bleed air, so basically take hot air from from the engine and, and route that through the through the wings. Um, and so they're using multiple systems there, and so you could you could pair a, a coating with that to to complement existing systems. Obviously, exactly. the holy grail is to eliminate the use of any of these active systems, right? If you just had a coating where you didn't have to use any heat, any anything mechanical, no moving parts, it's just a, a, a polymer sitting on a, a surface and it, it, it makes ice, you know, not build up. That is the that is the ultimate end goal. And I, I think you know everybody could agree on that. Um, the yes. challenges in the science and the physics of making that happen are 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 really really hard. It's a hard problem. That's why there isn't. Uh, that's why it's not solved yet, right? And that's mm -hmm. why we're you know I, I think we're you know we have you know the most compelling you know anti icing coating in the world today. But um, you know it's still one of those things where it's a it's a real challenge because you're battling 
physics ultimately like you, there there are two things you have to have at a minimum for for ice to build up you need moisture and you need the temperature to be below the freezing point of of water right and if you have those two things at, at a minimum you have to have those and if you take one of those away you're not going to get ice build up and so you know the bulk of of what what icing you know anti icing systems do now is just use heat so you're above the freezing point or use de icing fluids which depress the freezing point which mean you're now above mm -hmm. the freezing point and so there those are the games you play to to deal with ice with a passive coating you can't really do either of those so you have to find all of these clever ways to get around the physics and you know that's that's what we're doing that's what you know a lot of kind of super hydrophobic coatings that you know people are developing it's all kind of the same approach where you're you're trying to get around the the fundamentals of, of what causes ice to form woodpeckers hmm. we could train woodpeckers to do what they do <laughs> and chip it off when they stop so you know well, wait, we're, well, we're Brian, getting there too brian what is that sort of fundamental physics of the coating uh, obviously there's a lot of hydrophobic water repellent coatings from teflon to clothing scotch bright and all those kind of things what about your coating is it a hydrophobic coating is it a coating that has just unique features to it on the topology that makes it uh want to shed ice what what is that key ingredient or ingredients that that makes you unique yeah, you kind of hit on the two main classes of, of ice phobic coatings that exist. So some are, are hydrophobic or super hydrophobic. Some are have actually nano textured surfaces, which um, d do a lot of really interesting things with, with fluids on the top. Um, ours doesn't do either. So our, our, our coating mm -hmm. would be classified as a hydrophobic coating. Um, okay. But it's not a super hydrophobic. And, and in fact, most paints are actually hydrophobic just to, to varying degrees. Um, what, yeah. what our coating does is, so imagine a, a, just a, a piece of ice is frozen on a surface and you push on it. What happens is that the, the, the force gets kind of spread across that piece of ice relatively uniformly. It depends on the geometry and all that sort of stuff, right. but it'll get kind of spread across the ice. What our coating does is it has unique mechanical properties, and there's actually um, at a minimum two, two phases or components to our coating. And we get these sharp interfaces within the coating. This is all microscopic, so you can't see it. We get these sharp interfaces within the coating itself where the mechanical properties are very, very different. And so you get these discontinuities mm. in the mechanical properties of the coating. And so what happens is when you push on a piece of ice, forces get concentrated where those discontinuities are. So instead of having, say, a pound of force kind of uniformly spread across a piece of ice, that force gets concentrated into microscopic areas, but way, way beyond what you would expect for, mm. for a force that size. So we call the concept stress localization. Instead of yeah. having a uniform spread of a force it gets concentrated into really small areas and at those areas at those interfaces we get we cross the fracture energy so basically you get micro fractures so you can't see them um, but they they little fractures start forming and then once once a little bit cracks it just sort of you know snowballs no pun <laughs> no pun intended yeah. and and the and the whole thing just kind of loses mechanical integrity so does it does that make sense it does. It, it, it's just yeah. like a pane of glass, essentially. I mean, once you put that crack in it, it's just going to continue to propagate. You're just doing exactly. that in a lot of different surfaces. Wow, that's 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 fascinating because I I do think that lends itself uniquely um, to you know things, especially things that flex, like wind turbines that do flex and and wings too, right? So that just the flexing of a, a wing or, or or a turbine blade would be enough to basically shed the ice on its own. It wouldn't take much more than that, and. As we know, wind turbine blades are constantly flexing as they go around the, the, the circumference. Right. So the, it'd, be, it'd be like an automatic shedding process. That's that's amazing. That's amazing. And I, I do think I do think one of those little key features to the coating, because it has some rain erosion capability. You know, obviously, as most wind turbines start to uh, take age, the the leading edge of the turbine blades aren't necessarily designed to take the kind of abuse. Uh, that we would see in some parts of the United States in particular. And so the ice accretion is greater because the surfaces are just rougher. And now you have especially exposed fiberglass epoxy surfaces where ice tends to want to grab onto and hold onto. Right. So the combination then of, of being 
uh, basically rain erosion resistant and uh, fracturing the ice off at very low levels seems like a great combination. So in my head, I'm, I'm kind of picturing this as like little st stalactites, but like, which is it? Stalagmites, stalactites? I don't remember, but <laughs> would that be a good way to describe it, Brian? Where like, it sounds like at the microscopic level, there's like little spikes where the ice is just, that's what's going to cause those, those fracture localization. Is that, is that a reasonable way for me to help our YouTube folks <laughs> yeah. understand that? I don't know. That was how the way my brain worked. So. Yeah, just, yeah, I, I think that analogy works. So you can think of it just having, you know, um, um, you know, we, we have a just kind of a general matrix or there's the paint and within the paint, there's a bunch of little particles and at the interface where the paint and the particles meet, right? That's where these forces get concentrated. Hmm, okay. And so, okay. yeah, you can, you know, the, the morphology isn't quite like, you know, stalactites, which by the way, have to hold on tight so they come from mm -hmm. the roof and stalagmites mm. might reach the ceiling. Uh, so they, yeah, okay. so, um, Brian's but, a middle, uh, middle school science guy. Yeah, all right, yeah. all right. Um, that, that one has stuck with me. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, if, if, that, if that is helpful, I think that's a you know, good way of thinking about it. So what are the next, what are, what are the next steps in the coding then? Because it, it seems like you've done a lot of development, particularly with Boeing, and you've done rain erosion testing, which a lot of companies never get to that point of doing that. Uh, what's the next step in the coding? Because I know how these things go. There's always that sort of next phase in, in the de development of the technology. What do what those next steps look like? I, I think in terms of the major milestones, we've, we've already already hit, hit the big ones. We, we can demonstrate ice phobic properties um, and we can demonstrate durability with, with some of our formulations in terms of you know, passing rain erosion or even abrasion tests, all that sort of stuff. That wow. said, there's a very long tail of requirements on a paint that you still have to get through, right? So um, the, the, the dry time, uh, how long does it take? The pot life, um, right. the just production consistency of, of the coating. What is the shelf life uh, yeah. like? It, color yeah. matching. Um, how yeah. glossy yeah. is it? Right. Um, UV and weathering resistance, uh, right. chemical resistant. So there's a whole host of it. how hazardous or toxic is it? So do we need to, right. you know, our, our coatings are solvent based. Um, obviously, if you can move to a water based coating, there's a lot of benefits there, um, yeah. especially, you know, a lot of wind farms tend to be in places where, where people are, are, you know, can be environmentally conscious. And so, you know, if you right. get into Scandinavia, right, there, there's some pretty, you know, strict issues, you know, environmentally around, yeah. you know, controlling what you can, you know, what sort of paints and, and coatings you can use. And so there's a whole host of, of things that we have to address. Um, no deal breakers um, or certainly any that, that we found yet and we, we hope not to, to, to find any of course um, I think they're all even if we you know frankly do find you know one of those things we're not quite there yet with the coding um, they can be we can engineer our way around that right I mean the, these yeah. are problems that have been solved in, in other coatings right the problem that that hasn't or hadn't been solved was the ice shedding with durability right, right. that's the that's the right. core problem all these other ones are are just it, things that any paint that if you go to Home Depot, you got to all the paint, <laughs> all the paints have solved those problems. So it's a much easier right. solve. You know, those those are much easier, but they're not nothing. And they do require, you know, time and, and resources. And we're, we're still a young company. I mean, we're going to be, you know, we'll be fundraising this year. Right. So we'll need money sure. to to go through all that process. And it, it takes time and effort. Um, and so that's that's, you know, where we're at with with that. So. Wow. Okay, those are really cool next steps because I think you're right. The, the key technology is built into the materials, but if you need to adapt the materials to particular parts of the world or particular applications, you can do that because the fundamentals are still there. That That's that's really big in terms of a, a company and fundraising because the technology, the, the, the key technology is already done. That's a huge driver in terms of growth for your company. That's amazing, nice. 
Right. And yeah. we're doing, we're, we're using, you know, different kind of chemical bases, right? So we have a, you know, a polyurethane based one, which is the standard, you know, the top coats that are used for wind turbines now, you know, aerospace yeah. paints, uh, most automotive paints are polyurethanes. We also have rubberized versions though, which are uh, actually work really well on like wood, um, concrete, certain surfaces where um, hmm. we, we can even make them grippy. So like tacky. Um, so from a slip and fall prevention perspective, perspective you get a little extra grip and oh by the way you know the ice will crack when you step on it as opposed to just right. you know s- slipping on it on a you know a sheet of ice so we we have different versions of the coating that we're we're making for for these different applications and you know exactly wow. to your point it's all based on the same fundamental physics you know the same physical principles are underlying it all but we're you know now sort of translating it across these you know different chemistries so have you tried this on your on your dry? We out of the Massachusetts, so we're constantly covered in ice. Yeah, like Alan's ready to place an order. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, am, I, to... <laughs> I would do my driveway tomorrow <laughs> with the material because it does play a big. I mean, think about all the safety risks. I mean, I've fallen on the ice multiple times. Do you have a, snow, and... you have a snowblower, Alan? No, I don't. Well, get there first. Come on. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Still shoveling Look, snow. Uh, oh you yeah. It's like eight feet a year, and you're still shoveling it. Come on. We are still shoveling you're snow. You're putting the but... cart, cart before the horse, my man. <laughs> no, the problem with the problem with here is that uh, a lot of things tend to be blacktop. It's just the way that the asphalt is the driveway of choice around here, and it it fr- constantly refreezes, and so you've always got this one inch, two inch thick sheet of ice that is impossible to break off right uh, so having some coating on that driveway walkway whatever would be huge <laughs> it would be huge because it just reduced the amount of work you got to do it just would it'd be a lot safer yeah that's brilliant wow oh, that's cool technology yeah so we we do have it down on a, a few driveways um doing some kind of early uh early pilots if if you yeah. will um not my driveway personally we live in houston um <laughs> outside of of last month we don't uh really you know pretty much ever have any kind of ice or, or snow build up yeah uh, down here but uh yeah we are that's an that's an application that we're we're definitely looking at um obviously yeah. from a, a specification and you know all that sort of perspective it's much easier um you know you, do, you don't have quite the requirements uh, right. that you do with uh, you know a, a wind turbine or, or right with aerospace. yeah yeah well as we wrap up here i do want to talk about texas so uh brian you penned a nice article on linkedin and obviously you're in houston so you have a, a strong perspective on this and you went through it right so um can you tell us a little bit about what happened in texas and you know there's a lot of economic uh obviously fallout from it but you know as a texan and as someone who owns a business in texas who was affected by this on you know myriad angles um what what did you find most interesting about it and and where do you see texas going to prevent this in the future so it was a i'm I'm sure almost everyone kind of knows the the general story by now but yeah basically uh you know, a, a very um, unlikely winter storm, uh, you know, came through, basic, you know, the entire state. Texas's grid is effectively independent from the rest of the country, so it couldn't really be offset by, you know, increased power by, by somewhere else in the country. Um, and then, you know, it, it effectively crippled the grid and they had to, to you know, basically uh, cut demand, meaning turn off power at people's homes uh, to, uh, to to keep the grid from from fully blacking out. Um, you know, in my house, personally, we lost power for, you know, right around two days, two and a half days. Wow. Um, and it, you, you know, it was, um, you know, obviously a pain and, and not something that, um, you know, we effectively lost a week with the business, you know, our, we were closed and most businesses were closed for an mm. entire week, right? So you think of, you know, not only the actual costs in terms of, you know, very unfortunate, you know, some people actually actually died, but then, you know, the damage to people's homes from frozen pipes and all that sort of stuff, which there's been, you know, billions, if not tens of billions and, you know, estimated damages there, but then all the, you know, lost productivity from basically losing a week of of you know people being able to work so it was a it was a a really bad situation i I, you know as i've been kind of reflecting more about it i think you know there are a few takeaways i mean one is um these systems are are more vulnerable than i think we 
realize or or, or want to to appreciate. Um, and and there's uh, there wasn't you know and y'all have talked about this on your show, but you know there there wasn't one single cause. There were systemic failures across. It, almost every part of this, right? The, you know, wind power underperformed, gas underperformed, wells were frozen, uh, you know, even a nuclear plant tripped because they had some, you know, some of the, you know, they deal with a lot of water and they had some issues with some sensors freezing. Um, and then the communications were um, abhorrent. I mean, there's no other way to, there were no communications. It, it was pretty clear they had no idea that the scale of this was even possible, right? You yeah. compare it to responses from hurricanes and the, the communications are, you, you can't, you, you hear about it everywhere, the billboards on the highway and the news and the mayor's out, you know, before, hey, get, get your supplies or get out of town or whatever. There was none of that. And so that made it so much worse than it had to be because nobody was prepared. Everybody was caught flat footed. I'm sure plenty of people would have, um, you know, left or, you know, took a took a long weekend in New Orleans or, you know, did something to you know, right. basically yeah. get out of ERCOT, uh, ERCOT zone. Um, and so, I, I, you know, that was one thing that, uh, you know, I think a lot of people sort of understand now um, that these systems are vulnerable. You look at, you know, generator sales or, you know, their their back order, you know, whole home generator generators are back order for months. It's sort of a, yeah. you know, kind of heading back to this, you know, every person for themselves and, you know, <laughs> micro grid type uh, thing where, you mm -hmm. know, people want to have that ability themselves. Sure. Um, I, I think the other thing is um, I, assessing the, and this comes back to our risk conversation, but uh, assessing how likely these risks are is, is so, so hard. Um, and obviously they, you know, they, they failed here. Um, but you know, we, the bottom line is this could happen again next year. We may not have another storm like this, you know, in our lifetimes. Right. And so how do you, how do you put a dollar amount against something like that? Um, and it, it, you know, it's really hard to say, um, what I, what I do find interesting though, and I, I've generally developed a, a distrust for a lot of the, you know, quote unquote, uh, you know, official stuff is, you know, this was, you know, apparently maybe, a you know, once every few decades storm, um, hurricane Harvey, um, you know, when it, it hit Houston was a, a once every 500 year storm, uh, 2016, there was the, uh, tax day floods. You may or may not be familiar with those. Everybody from, from South Southeast Texas will be. That was a once in 500 year storm. And then 2015, wow. there was, I believe, the Memorial Day floods, another one in 500 year storm. So <clears throat> believe it or not, Houston had three consecutive years with <laughs> one in 500 year storms. Now, either we are living in a truly, truly exceptional <laughs> era, or the uh, the probabilities being assigned to these sorts of events are, are fundamentally flawed, um, and I, I, yeah. I tend to fall in, into the to the you know latter camp. Now, is that a, a consequence of you know perhaps it's, it's global warming driven? Perhaps you know there's something else going on. I don't know, yeah. um, but what I do know is that you know what, assigning probabilities to these sorts of things is, is so difficult. Um, but there is, it's, it's pretty clear that we're not doing the cost benefit analysis correctly. I think we can say that, um, uh, is, is categorically true given the costs yeah. associated with, with the last right. event. Um, and, and then just one last thing around, you know, the other kind of main conclusion is like, we, we have to do something about it. I mean, the, the status quo, you know, it can't remain. I, th I think there has to be some level of, of mitigation, um, at a minimum, just for people to save face and there'll be just the, the appearance aspect of it. But I think ultimately what we're going to have to do is step back, look at all of the different causes, everything that went wrong against every part of energy production of the grid. So not just wind, mm -hmm. but every part. What went wrong? How big of a problem was it? Meaning, you know, how many, basically how many megawatt hours were lost? Um, and then what would it cost to, to make that not a problem in the future. And then basically at, make a table of, of everything, everything we could possibly do, how big of a problem it was and how much it would cost to fix it. And then just figure out what our what our cutoff, cutoff is and let's do yeah. the highest impact ones, the ones that are cheapest and that would keep the most energy production online and, and just do some of those things, right? And I, I'm sure there are some simple things 
um, some very simple things um, that that could be done that would make a big difference. Um, whether or not you know putting active heating on wind turbines or even putting coatings on wind turbines is would that qualify as one of them? Who knows? But it does need to be. We need to figure that out, right? We, and we, you know, we need to methodically think through it and understand, um, you know, what can we do? And if, if you know, I, I would love if our company can, you know, obviously play a role in that. Um, but I think there's a lot of thought that needs to be put into, you know, what what does the future of the grid look like, given that these sort of climatic event, you know, these these weather events appear to be, you know, more more common and, and more extreme than than ever before. So, yeah, I think that forecasting is it's baffling. Well, and also want to hear your, your perspective on, on grid scale energy storage, because you've done a lot of your Ph.D. research on that. I mean, is it possible to have big enough batteries to to really offset, um, you know, a whole municipality or a whole state? I mean, what could grid scale storage do to prevent some of this stuff in the future? Yeah, um, so it is possible to, to have storage that could power towns or, or regions for extended periods of time. Um, but there's there's two caveat, caveats there. One, the, the costs um, are, are prohibitive still at, at this point. And that's why you haven't seen um, deployment to like, you know, power a town for days and kind of, you know, back up power like that. Um, two, the, the, the way there actually is storage that can do that today, but it's not battery based or any kind of fancy technology. It's pumped hydroelectric. So they can use dams as a way to, uh, to store power and they can store absolutely massive amounts of power. Um, and so there, there are are installations that that use pumped hydroelectric that can supply power to to a huge number of, of users uh, over long periods of time. The the bulk of, of storage that you've seen come into the market um, recently, so I'll say in the past decade, um, has been dealing with with different niche problems. So uh, a, a big one was frequency regulation and basically it's a power quality so you know you want to keep the 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 power coming on the grid at you know 60 hertz and and as close to 60 hertz as possible and if it deviates actually even small amounts it could fry you know literally every electronic that's that's connected to it so you don't want that and so they'll use uh, batteries, um, lithium ions, the most common at, at this point for this this application. But they'll use batteries to uh, to help basically, you know, condition the power, improve the power quality. Um, and you're seeing some of that. the The types of things that I, I worked on in grad, in grad school was 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 grid scale batteries. So so very big batteries, but meant. Um, to provide the something closer to the the storage that like pumped hydro has so much big in terms of kilowatt hour amounts, um, but not necessarily the instant power uh, and high power that like lithium ion batteries provide. Because what lithium ion does is it provides a lot of power very quickly. You can't store a ton though, or rather, if you want to store a ton, it's really, really expensive, right? Because lithium ion batteries are, you know, you, you look at, you know, a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack on a Tesla, you know, and I, I don't know what the battery pack costs, but it's probably $40,000, maybe more. It's a significant fraction of the of the overall cost of the car, right? So it's really expensive. And 100 kilowatt hours is nothing for when you're talking about a home, right? Or right. A, mm-hmm. a neighborhood. I mean, it, right. it's it's nothing, right? Um, and, and so you, you have to get into that megawatt hour scale. And there are other battery types that are much, much cheaper than lithium ion. Um, they're not dense, um, so you can't use them for portable electronics, um, but they're water based and they can, they're very cheap on a per kilowatt hour basis. And so those are the sort of batteries that I worked on and that I think, you know, ultimately will play a role in, in storage moving forward. I mean, we're not going to end up with a, a one size fits all where there's just, you know, one technology that, hey, this is how we store store power on the grid, we're going to end up with a broad, um, you know, basically different technologies, pumped hydro, lithium batteries, um, you know, flow batteries, which are the kind of batteries I was describing earlier. Mm-hmm. There's even, I mean, there's, there's storing energy in compressed air in caverns. Well, I've seen those like rail, rail car things where they like <laughs> yeah. ship them yeah. up the mountain, then they come back down the mountain. Exactly. What, what is that called? I'm not gonna be able to pull it out of my brain. It's a gravity based system, just like the yeah, water is. Just, uh, yeah. 
there's ones where people put concrete blocks on cranes. There's um, oh yeah, there's sure fly we- flywheels, um, which are actually used not not just for kind of grid applications, but they actually use flywheels when they for like really crazy uh, scientific equipment, like particle colliders and stuff, where they need insane <laughs> amounts of energy really quick, and so they'll connect yeah. these big flywheels. Um, so there's all there's a whole plethora of uh, technologies there. Um, and I think, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, some selection of those is going to end up playing a role. But as we move to, you know, it's inevitable we're going to be moving to, to more wind, more solar, more intermittent renewables. The the demand for storage is, is going to go up and up, right? Because, you know, ultimately we don't control when the wind blows. And so we're going to need that that storage on on the grid um and so i I think it's a it's a fascinating market and there's a a, you know a ton of really innovative stuff uh going on there and i was uh it was it was great to spend uh, kind of the early part of my career working on it well you only need 1.21 gigawatts to get the flux capacitor (laughs) up to the proper amount of electrons and then you can go to any time period you want so just throwing that out there it's a back to the future reference if you yeah, I just I, watch I them. Yeah. I know, but for those who are listening, if you didn't get that, that's where my mind is as, you're, as Brian's talking. Um, but Brian, I mean, this is a fascinating conversation, and uh, yes. we, we really appreciate your expertise on lots of different um, topics here in, in energy and coatings and in the wind industry and in Texas. Um, where can people follow up with you and with Elemental Coatings? And, you know, what else? Uh, where can you direct our, our viewers who are interested in learning more? Yeah, um, elementalcoatings.com, um, you know, have, have plenty of videos on there, by the way, if you're just kind of interested to see the see the product in action. Um, so, so go check us out there. Um, I'm, you know, my contact information is on there. I'm on, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, all the, all the usual suspects. So, so feel free to reach out. Um, again, we're, uh, we're, we're actively looking for partners. Um, we'll also be, uh, you know, we're going to be fundraising, uh, here soon. So if on any, any of those topics, uh, you know, would love to, love to hear from you. And thanks again for, for having me, uh, Dan and Alan. Yeah, we appreciate you. And we will link to all of Brian's uh, contact info, like you said, his social media, web pages, all that stuff. So it'll be easy. So if you're listening on YouTube or in you know, iTunes, Spotify, wherever, just check out the description and you'll find links to all that stuff below. Brian, thanks again. It was a, it was a great time chatting with you. Thank you. All right. So that'll do it for this episode of Uptime. Thanks again to our guest, Brian Huskinson of Elemental Coatings. As always, be sure to check out the description links below for ways to follow up on their company. You know, find them on uh, their website, social media, all that stuff. Connect with Brian on LinkedIn. And no matter where you're listening, be sure to share the show, subscribe. And we, like I said, we always appreciate you listening. Feel free to share it with a friend and shoot us an email if you have input, insight, or suggestions for a future topic or a future guest. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time on the Uptime Podcast. Is downtime causing you financial pain and putting a stop to your power production for months on end? It's no secret, lightning strike damage is a major cause of wind turbine downtime. This damage is preventable with our easy-to-install strike tape lightning protection system for wind turbine blades. Our incredible engineering, build quality, materials, and edge sealants withstand up to five times more abuse in the toughest weather and lightning conditions. And we've got the research to prove it. If you're tired of constant downtime, we can help. Reach out to us at weatherguardwind.com and schedule a free call. We'll get your uptime back in no time.